Well, without further ado, we'd like to welcome you to our Birds of Prey session. Um, today's session will be led by Kathy Church. Kathy is a programming coordinator and wildlife interpretive specialist for the Georgia Department of Natural Resources. She has a Bachelor of Science in Wildlife Management from the Warnell School of Forestry at UGA and an MET in Secondary Science Education from Piedmont College. She taught high school science for almost 15 years before joining DNR and has spent her whole life living in and exploring the forests of Northeast Georgia. So we'd love to welcome you, Kathy, and we will go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you. Let me share my, oh, I need to be able to share screen, please. Oh, sorry about that. That's okay. There you go. One of those Zoom I know. Know. <laughs> growing pains that we all have. That's just the way it goes. There we go. All right, can you guys see that okay? Big birdie. And can we see me? Yay! All right. Um, like she said, my name is Kathy Church, and all of that programming coordinator, wildlife interpretive specialist, all boils down to teacher. That's what I do. Um, in the state of Georgia, in the Department of Natural Resources, in the Wildlife Resources Division, we actually have seven educational centers. And they're spread out all over the state. So up here in the northeastern corner in Helen, if any of you guys have ever been tubing or had fudge or any of that good kind of stuff, we're up here in the mountains. Um, and we are the Smith Gall Woods Regional Education Center. So what I do every day all the time is either have people here at the park for programming, which could be schools, church groups, you know, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, anything of that nature, or I actually travel out too. And a lot more of what I do is outreach. So I get to carry these guys around, which is very interesting when people walk by my vehicle in the parking lot and they see, they see red tail hogs head sticking out the window. Can't tell you how many times I've heard, ah! you know, as people walk by, but that's what I do. I travel out, I bring animals, whether live or mounts or furs and skulls and pelts and all that kind of stuff. And I get to talk about these amazing animals. And since we're talking about birds of prey, the reason we left the chat open is simple because I like to find out what you already know so that you don't have to hear things that you already know. So take a second and in the chat, just tell me what makes a bird a bird? What is something a bird has that nobody else has? So just take, we'll take 15 seconds. Type in what a bird has that nobody else has. Ooh, hollow bones, good one. Feathers, fantastic. Hollow bones, feathers, can you think of anything else that's a bird? Wings, good idea, good idea. Gizzard, also good idea, also good idea. There are a lot of things that people think, beak, very good. A lot of things that people think are special only to birds that actually aren't special to only birds. For example, the beak, not special to birds. Birds do have a beak, but so do turtles, and so do squid and octopi and things like that. They have a beak. But to be a bird, the rule is, is you can't have teeth. So other animals can have a beak, but a bird can't have teeth. Now, certain birds have modifications to their beaks, like this is a bald eagle skull, and he's definitely got this very sharp hooked beak, but if he were a duck and he needed to grab wet slippery things, then his beak would be jagged so that he could actually grip and hang on to it. If he was more like a woodpecker and he needed to dig in that tree, then that beak would be long and strong to be able to actually dig in there. Hummingbird, of course, he's got that long beak, but he's also got that long tongue that forks out and grabs. So they all have some sort of beak, but for a different kind of job. So that's one of the special things about birds of prey. They've got this super hooked beak that allows them to rip and tear meat. That's one thing that they have that all birds have got that makes them different. Feathers, definitely. Feathers are a major. When people say wings, well, that's not necessarily true because bats, butterflies, any kind of bees, insects, they've all got wings and they have the ability to fly, but your wings do not have feathers. So if they're a bat, they've got skin instead of feathers. 
If they're an insect, it's more of a film type of material. So for a bird, feathers, definitely a major. And the hollow bones, also important. But there's actually one other thing that most people don't think about, and it has to do with bird reproduction. What is something else that is special to birds having to do with reproduction? Let me think. Baby birds. Oh yeah, cloaca, but birds aren't the only ones with a cloaca. Turtles, cloaca too. A lot of reptiles, cloacas, snakes, good kind of stuff. But what comes out of that cloaca? Oh yes, it is about the eggs. Not that it is eggs because lots of animals, snakes, lizards, turtles, all kinds of animals lay eggs, but there's something different about a bird's egg. Like this very specialized chicken egg. <laughs> If we notice, it's not a hard shell. Nobody else, well, there are actually a couple of species of turtle that lay hard shells, but very, very rarely. But birds always lay hard shells. The important question is why? Why does a bird's shell have to be hard when a fish's egg is not hard, a lizard's egg is not hard? Birds, why do they have to have a hard shell instead of just a regular old shell? Hmm. And Cecilia, I don't know if I'm always getting the chat, but I can see part of it. It is actually permeable. Crystal, ooh, good point. It is actually permeable. Gases can actually travel in and out of this egg. Now they do have an air pocket at the top, which is actually the air source basically for the embryo, but it is actually permeable. It doesn't leak, but it is permeable. It has more to do with mom. Think about what mom does to that little baby egg right there. She sits on it. Absolutely. Well, if this was a soft egg, like a fish or say a snake, and that mama sat on it, well, guess what? No more baby. So if you notice, most eggs have the same shape, this oval shape, because when it doesn't have a hole in it, like this one does, because you kind of have to get everything out of there, this is an exceptionally strong shape. So the eggs actually sit this way in the nest so that when mama sits on top of it, it can withstand a lot of pressure. Turtles, snakes, lizards, those guys do not protect their babies. They lay and leave. So turtles usually lay and bury and leave it. That keeps the thermal regulation going, keeps the heat the right temperature. Snakes lay it wherever it is and leave it. Lizards tend to lay it under rocks and things like that. But birds, they're endotherms. So they actually have to sit on it and keep it warm. So cool thing is medium-sized bird, like a chicken, lays a medium-sized egg. But what if you are the largest bird in the world? Now check out the difference. <laughs> Who's the largest bird in the world? Not largest wingspan though. That's the wandering albatross. Yeah, this is an ostrich egg and completely real. You can see where it's out. But this egg, if it were whole, you could actually stand a 200 pound person on a simple pack egg and it wouldn't break because it's a big bird, gotta have a very, very protected egg. But what if you are the tiniest bird in the world? Like this, look at that. Now who's the tiniest bird in the world? Yeah, it's the bee hummingbird. Now to give you an idea, a bee hummingbird, when it's a full grown adult is about the size of my thumb. So that is the size of baby egg. But now, do you think there's everything in this egg the same as there is in that big ostrich egg? The same, all the same stuff in there and here? For sure, absolutely. Absolutely everything that this little baby needs is the same as what that little baby needs. Only difference is big baby hatches out of that one, tiny baby hatches out of this one, quite easy. The best part about that is Tic Tacs are the same size as hummingbird eggs. So I don't have to worry about keeping a tiny little egg. I can just have a Tic Tac in nice fresh breath. Makes it easy. <laughs> so to be a bird, the rules are quite simple. You gotta have some feathers. You can't have any teeth. You gotta have a backbone. You gotta be a vertebrate like us. You gotta be an endotherm or warm blooded like us. Hollow bones and that lovely egg laying feature, those hard eggs. Now we know in nature there are always exceptions and there are always rules that are different and things of that nature, but that's the basic rules for a bird. 
So whether you're a bird of prey or you're a hummingbird or you're a woodpecker or you're a turkey, it doesn't matter. They all have the same basic structure. But even if you are a flightless bird, you're still built for flight, basically. You just may have some modifications. Originally, birds were built for flight, so they have modifications to make them nice and light. There are tons of them. But one of my personal, personal favorites is the fact that a lot of birds don't have a bladder. Now that seems kind of crazy because we know what would happen to a human if we didn't have a bladder. Yeah, we would just leak out all over the place and it would be really nasty. But we don't see birds flying around or walking around just leaking out all over the place. And this is a brilliant adaptation for protection. Because if you think about a bird, where is the absolute safest place for a bird to be? Where do you think is the safest place a bird can be out of anywhere? Hmm, nest? There you go, the air. The air is the key because in a nest, if you're a ground dwelling bird, your nest is on the ground. That means anything crawling around the ground is gonna get you. Raccoon, possum, bobcat, any of that. Even nests up in the air. Number one killer of songbirds in the United States, house cats. Over a million songbirds a year are killed in just the United States from house cats. Cats that are let out to potty or allowed to just live outside, straight up the nest, bird is gone, eggs gone, everything. So the safest place for a bird to be is in the air. So what that means is landing is very dangerous and especially having to land and get water because everybody's gotta have water. So that means if you are at that water source, everybody's coming to that water source. Predator, prey, the works. So for a bird, they do not want to have to actually land and get water unless they have to, it's not safe. So the reason they don't leak, even though that seems like a long story, is because this is a brilliant way of protecting yourself. Birds use almost every drop of water they drink. We waste the majority of the water we drink. So when we urinate, it's mostly water with some uric acid and other waste and things like that. But a bird's body actually uptakes almost every bit of water so that when they actually do defecate or urinate, that's why it looks like a paste. So if you've ever seen bird poop, it's white with that little a brown right in the middle. The white is actually uric acid, that's urine. The brown is the actual feces. And so by using that water, that means two super important things. One, that bird does not have to drink very often. And two, he doesn't have to drink very much. So if his body's gonna use the majority of the water, he can go longer without drinking or drinking smaller amounts, which means that he can stay in the air where he's safer longer. It's genius, it's a super smart thing. But we talked about the hollow bones. The key is look down in the corner there, right down here in your bottom corner. A bird's bones are not truly hollow. If they were, they would be completely useless. Think about how many times you've been to a restaurant and you grab the straw, you gotta tap the straw on the table to get the paper off the straw, and as you tap, the straw just breaks. Well, then you got a hole in your straw, and that straw is completely useless. Or you can do like I do and just stick your finger over the hole and keep drinking through the straw, it still works, who cares? But if a bird's bones were truly hollow, that is exactly what would happen. When that bird landed, hit something, got into a fight, anything, bones would just break. So imagine you take the exact same straw and fill it full of toothpicks in all directions, all the way down that cylinder. It's not gonna make it that much heavier, but it's gonna make it exceptionally strong. So it keeps the bones and the whole skeleton of the bird nice and light by not being solid, but also supported on the inside by having those pieces that we call spicules, those little bones. And this is one of the reasons why we never, ever, 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 ever feed dogs bird bones. No cooked bones whatsoever, but bird bones are exceptionally dangerous because of those spicules. When a dog bites into it, those pieces can actually lodge in their throat and cause some serious damage, even possibly kill them. But that makes the bird light, but still very strong. So you add the light body to having these great feathers for flying, and you're gonna be taken off and going wherever you need to. But most people forget that there's not one kind of feathers. When we think feathers, we tend to think flight feathers. This is big, so I have to back it up. Oh, you get an idea. This is a golden eagle's wing. 
here's a just a comparison. This is a barred owl. The golden eagle. <laughs> but on a wing, whether a giant eagle's wing or whether a small little owl's wing, it's not right. There are actually different types of feathers. So if you look, there are these little feathers right here that are kind of smaller. There are these longer guys that kind of stick off on their own right here. And then these shorter guys and these little guys right up next to the body. Now, in science, we like to make things as hard as possible. So we call these first feathers primary feathers. The second ones we call secondary feathers and the third ones we call tertiary feathers, okay? Yeah. The key is, is each one of these guys get kind of different names because they do kind of different jobs. These primaries, these guys are cool. Birds can move these primaries almost like you can wiggle your fingers. So they can open them up, they can close them up, they can change the direction. And this allows that bird to make super sharp movements and get a lot of speed quickly, depending upon the bird. The secondaries though, check out this shape. It's kind of hard to see. You see how it looks like a bowl? These secondaries are vital because these secondaries are what are actually catching the air and pushing it. And if you imagine having, say, just a cup and you've got a bathtub, if you take a cup and push it through the water in your bathtub, then you know that that cup is going to push that amount of water. Water and air are both fluids. So a bird with a cupped wing pushing through the air works exactly like it does to push a cup through water. So imagine instead of having a cup, you have a bucket and a swimming pool. It's going to take a lot more work, but you're going to push a lot more water. Bigger bird, bigger wing, you push a lot more air. That means you get a big difference in speed and things of that nature. So if you notice with the owl versus the eagle, much larger, much smaller. Eagle is depending upon speed. Owl is depending upon stealth. So it's not a speed thing for him. But even the body is covered in feathers. Like this little guy right here. Hi, my little squeaky. Now we notice he's got feathers on his head, on his back, on his belly. All of these are contour feathers. Again, science is really difficult naming system. Contours the body. Okay, the contour feathers. But really the most important ones are the ones under there. If you get up under, up under those contour feathers like these, then what you're gonna see is a whole bunch of feathers like this bottom half. This is downy material. And downy does not help with flight. It does not help with, you know, keeping off rain and sleet and snow like the contour feathers do. But most importantly, downy is your insulator. And it does so quite simply. What downy feathers do is catch air. And that's why it's kind of hard to tell on the video. See how those guys move on their own? They easily, easily catch air. And that's what makes downy feathers just float so slowly. So when a bird is cold, what that bird does is fluff up those feathers. If you've ever seen, if you've ever had chickens in your yard, then what you'll see is, is when it's warm during the daytime, you'll have chicken. In the morning when it's cold, you'll have a chicken. It's the same bird, but what that bird has done is fluff those feathers and those downy feathers trap air up under there. His warm body then heats that air and that actually keeps the whole bird warm. Works fantastic. So even though flight feathers are important, if a bird can't fly but he can find food, he'll survive. Contour feathers, also important. But if a bird can't keep out of the rain or something, he's in trouble. But if he can find shelter and he can find food, he's gonna be all right. But if a bird can't keep warm, it's not gonna matter. He can't, he can't regulate his body temperature. He's not gonna be in a good way. So this is why even some birds that we rescue and things like that, they may not be able to fly again, but they can survive. That's not a problem. So long as they can get food and water and shelter and all that good kind of stuff. But to me, the super cool thing about feathers is a feather is not one piece. If you've ever picked up a feather and looked at it and taken it apart, just click your thumbs up button. Click your raise hand button. Ladies, it's not a question. I just wanna know if they've done it. Just raise hand. Because a lot of people are afraid to pick up a feather. 
Now, there, of course, there are good reasons. We don't like to pick up wild things out of the woods, you know, bacteria, diseases, even lice and things of that nature, not always a good idea. But if you're not afraid to pick one up and you wanna pick one up and maybe you have a pet bird, just pick it up and look at it closely. Feathers are fascinating. There are different parts to the feather. The whole thing is called the vein and then you've got the rachis and all this kind of stuff. But what's really cool is almost impossible to see. If you take this feather and pull it apart, there are all these little pieces held together. Now, if you could actually, you can't see it on this camera because it's, it's tiny. I can barely see it with my eyes. But each of those little tiny pieces looks kind of fuzzy. And it's because there are little hooks all along that little tiny piece. And those little hooks are called barbs. Now, if you actually take a microscope and look at those little tiny pieces, they have their own little tiny pieces. So it's like this interwoven Velcro series that the feathers have. So if a bird gets into a storm or a fight and that feather gets torn up, no problem. Bird does what we call preening. He actually takes his beak and you've probably seen, if you've ever seen geese out on the pond, the goose will turn his head around and go, all down his wings, all down his chest, all down his back. He's doing a couple of things. He's actually putting these feathers back together because when they take that beak, bill, whatever you'd like to call it, and run it down, it actually rehooks all of those little pieces. But now sometimes, like this feather, it's just plain old got a hole in it. Okay, it's just broken. The top's broken up here, so there's no. <laughs> There's no saving that one. So when they preen, they will also pull that feather right out. But if you look at this, look at the size of that shaft. I mean, it's almost as big around as my finger. So that has absolutely got to hurt to pull it out of your skin. No, not really. <laughs> You'll never see a goose out on the pond like, quack, oh God, that hurts so bad. No, they don't do that. It's actually just made out of keratin, just like your hair. So when they get rid of them, gone. They even molt them. So we know that at, from juveniles to adults, sometimes they molt out whole entire sets of feathers. So for example, bald eagle, most people don't know that a bald eagle is actually a lovely chocolate brown, close to black color for a very long time until he becomes an adult and he molts that out and he gets the white head that we know. Um, a lot of times you will see, say buzzards or vultures flying above and you'll see they'll be missing a feather here and they'll be missing a feather here. Well, when they're on the same, you know, basic same place and same, you know, on each side, that's just regular old molting, getting rid of feathers. The great thing is because we know they molt, then we can use this to our advantage. For example, when we want to band geese, geese molt, they drop everything all at once, which means for a time period, they are flightless. Now that's exceptionally dangerous for the goose, but that's fantastic when you actually want to catch a bird. Because if it's a flying bird, that's a tough job to do. So what we do is, is when they drop their feathers, we actually just take one of those little baby gate things that you keep puppies in, you know, and we just walk up and close them in because they can't fly away. Pick them up, age them, sex them, band them, let them go. And that's how we actually track a lot of those guys. Some we have to bring in, like when we band doves and things, we have to bring those in with food and that type of stuff. But geese, yeah, they're molting, no problem. So if you get the chance, just pick up a feather and take a look at it and check out some of those really cool things that feathers have. Well, I promise we were gonna talk about birds of prey. This, this is the list of birds of prey found in Georgia. Now that is a long list. And of course there is absolutely no way that I could ever talk about every single one of these today. But what I'm curious about is, is there a bird on there that you've just never heard of? If there's a bird on that list you've never heard of, type it in the chat. I want to see what people have never, ever heard of. Ooh, Merlin, good one, yeah. A lot of people haven't heard of Merlin. He just sounds like a magician from Arthur time. Mm hmm Oh, Harrier, Northern Harrier, absolutely. Oh, good, yeah. Oh, Kestrel, he's one of my favorites. Yay, we're going to talk about him. Sharp Shin Hawk. There's actually some debate about sharp shin and Cooper's hawk. Are they the same animal? Are they not the same animal? They look very similar. How do we tell them apart? All kinds of stuff. And I like to ask that because a lot of times it depends on where you're from. Uh, 
earlier before some of you guys came in, a question was asked about some of the birds and you know, Mississippi kite and things like that. And one of the things that I mentioned was a lot of these birds are regional. And so even though all of these guys are found in Georgia, you're not going to find things like Mississippi kites and, you know, swallow-tailed kites and things like that in the mountains. They're not that type of bird. Um, so some of them especially like to be near the shore. Some of them specialize in being, you know, up in the mountains. Some of them like um, golden eagles. Those guys, they are exceptionally, exceptionally shy. So DNR even tried to actually count golden eagle nests and track them. They were so hard to track and find that we just gave up. So they're listed as rare. It's not impossible to see one, but the likelihood that you would, extremely rare. Now I'm lucky. I have been one of the few people that actually did get to see one. It flew right over the top of my house, right over the top of my head. And you've never seen somebody fangirl so hard in your life. I was like, <laughs> I got so excited. Um, but it just, it depends on what they eat and where their food source is and what's their best habitat and things like that. And of course, bald eagle is one of our greatest accomplishments because that guy is coming back big time and he's moved all over the state now instead of being pretty much just around the coast, which is where he was. But we are going to talk about some of these guys, just not all of them, because like I say, we don't have all day. But when we talk about birds of prey, we always split them into two groups, owls and everybody else. Now, why do you think we separate owls from everybody else? It's the one thing that makes owls different from all other birds of prey. Oh, fabulous. There you go. They are nocturnal. Absolutely. So if you are nocturnal, then you actually need some specialized tools for working at night. So when we look at owls, like this lovely fellow here, this is a barred owl. <laughs> One of the first things that we notice about an owl are those big eyes. Now, have you ever seen a live owl? And see it up there. A raptor on the ground or a deer in the pond. And the eyes are even more outstanding. You see those beautiful golden eyes in a live owl. Or a nice, deep, rich, ambery brown kind of color. But those eyes are huge the following reason. When I say huge, <laughs> you got to understand. An owl's eyes are so big that their skull can't be built like ours. So for us, around our eyes, we have these lovely rings of muscles, and that allows us to move our eyes all the way around, and, you know, teenagers to roll their eyes. Oh, God. <laughs> that allows us to move our eyes wherever we need to. For these guys, those eyeballs are so big and so heavy that they actually have, let's see if you can see it. See this, this bone right here? They actually have a bone around their eye that holds up their eyeball. So their eye is actually attached to their head. And it's not just that it's big, it's heavy. For an owl, their eyes are not round like ours, they're tubular. And if you think about it, it makes complete and total sense. If you wanna see far away, the tools that you use are binoculars, telescope, things of that nature. Think about the shape, they're a tube. So that's a long distance eye is basically what it is. So when an owl, his eyeballs go from the front of his head to the back of his head. Iris stop right there. Let's go all the way to the back of his head. In a red-tailed hawk like this one, his eyeballs actually touch in the center of his head. They're so big. Most birds of prey's eyeballs actually have a major brain. So think about what Mother Nature thought was more important, seeing well or solving puzzles. Obviously seeing well. So that is the reason that owls have to move their heads because their eyeballs can't move. They're fixed in that position. But I love to ask this question, and I know that most of us are adults, and most of us are going to get it right. How far can an owl actually turn his head? How can he turn? How far can he turn his head? How far do you think? Out of 360 degrees, how far can he turn his head? what our chat says. Oh, I love it. I always tell kids this, any animal that head goes all the way around comes off and they're not alive anymore. <laughs> an owl cannot turn 360. He can turn 270. But that's not just an owl thing. That's a bird of prey thing. Red tail hawk can do it too. 
people don't know the red ball hawk can turn his head like that. Because again, big giant eyes attached to your head. So what that means for an owl, if he were sitting forward looking at you, he could turn completely to his right, all the way to the back, totally to the left before he's got to come back around again. And he can do it because his neck is built for it. We have seven cervical vertebrae, they have 14. So they have more rotation than you. It makes total sense. But here's where it all ties together and to me is absolutely brilliant. His eyes and his ears actually work together. So if we look at this guy again, okay, look at these eyeballs. I'm trying to get as close as you can see the image. He's seven. Hey, Kathy, I don't mean to cut you off. I don't mean to cut you off, but when you hold it in front of your um, screen like that, we can't hear you very well. So maybe if you put it a little bit off to the side or try and keep your face a little bit closer to your computer. Um, okay. That's better, yes, yes. Okay. So if you notice these little feathers right here around his eyes, mm, these are called the facial disc. And this is actually acting like the pinna of your ear. So for us, the pinna of our ear catches sound, tracks it into the ear so we can hear. Same thing for the owl, the facial disc catches sound and directs it into his ear. The awesome thing is he's got an ear up top and an ear down below. So not only does this guy hear right and left, but he also hears top and bottom. So he's actually pinpointing where that sound is coming for, from in all spatial directions. But notice that the facial disc is with his eyes. So what that means for an owl is if he's watching a prey, he's also listening to it at the same time. So that means that he can actually direct what he's listening to in the same direction as what he's looking at. This makes him an absolute expert predator. Now add that to this sharp beak and his sharp talons, which they have some fiercely sharp talons. He's a fabulous predator. But we said that owls are working based upon stealth. So when we looked at wings, we saw the owl wing was much smaller and that was meant for silence, not speed. What's really cool is if you look really close at an owl's wing, and we'll see if we can see it. An owl's wing is not sharp on the edges. It's actually tattered. It's not torn. The feathers grow that way, all the way around. And what it does very simply is this. For any sound to occur, just like me speaking, we have to compress the air and push it forward, and that's what our ears pick up as sound. Those little bitty tatters take that sound and make it swirl. And so by making it swirl, it actually makes that flight silent. Eagles don't care. Those guys are flying at like 175 miles per hour. They're gonna catch up with and overtake whatever they have so they don't care about sneaking up on. So when you're faster and you have sharp edges as they flap those big giant wings, it actually makes noise. It goes boom, boom, boom. They don't care, they're not sneaking up owls working in the dark. So by having those tattered feathers and having feather coated feet, that actually breaks up that sound and gives them virtually silent flight. So if you've ever gone out looking for owls at night, then that flight is not going to help you find where that owl just went because he's so quiet. The one thing about owls that is just a soapbox thing for me is that when you're doing things like growing a garden or even getting rid of pests around your house and things like that, sometimes you have to think about animals like owls because these guys feed primarily on small rodents and mammals and that kind of stuff. So they're eating you know, rats and mice and moles and voles and all that kind of stuff. Well, if you have a garden and you're using pesticide on your garden, you're not missing the moles and the voles and the mice and things that are in there. You're just spraying over the top of everything. If that guy turns around and eats it, especially if he eats multiples, then that poison just builds up and a lot of owls and a lot of red hawks and things get poisoned. Even when you use poison inside your house, what that poison does, it makes that rat or mouse thirsty. They go out to try to find water, which is why they leave your house. That red tailed hawk sees him going through the field trying to find water and he eats the mouse that's completely full of poison. So just something that we have to think about as humans when we're, you know, taking care of our pest problems is what are the better options? You know, snap trap or poison, it's totally up to you, but that's me a personal type of thing. 
but most owls swallow their food whole, which we know. And of course, since they can't break down hair and bones and things like that, they actually drop those owl pellets. Awesome thing is you can just find them laying around in the woods, pick them apart. You can tell exactly what they're eating. You can actually put that little animal back together and it's a fun activity, especially if you got kids or students or anything like that, to actually put those guys back together. And if you're a teacher, you know that you can just order them online instead of having to go look for them. But if you're, you know, want to do it with your kids, that's a fun activity just to go out, walk around the woods next to a field and see if you find some, pick them apart, totally fun. But I like to talk about some of the guys that you would see in Georgia or around here. And of course, our barred owl. This is one of the most common owls around here. And most people in this park call him hoot owl. Now, we don't call him hoot owl because he says hoot. He says hoot sorta, but not really. We call him hoot owl because he talks a lot, constantly. Now, they're gonna do a lot of talking in spring and summer, which makes sense. Spring, that's mating time. So when they talk, that's, hey girl, hey, come on over to my nest, I got a hot tub in the back, you know, anything to attract a mate, that's what they're doing. In the summer though, why do you think they're talking so much in the summer? What would owls and other birds have to talk about in the summertime? What do you think in the chat? Mm. Definitely. Because remember spring, you're trying to bring in that mate. By the summer, you've got babies and you are exceptionally territorial, okay? You are protecting those babies, even though not for long, weeks, couple months, they're, they're leaving on their own, but you are definitely talking and saying, hey, this is my territory, know where it ends, stay away from my babies and my food source and all that good kind of stuff. But if you want to find an owl, this is a camouflaged animal in the dark, you're not gonna find it. It's probably gonna be up in a tree or something of that nature. So when we go looking for birds, any of you guys that are birders, you know, we do not look for birds, we listen for birds. And the great thing is every bird has a different call, even has multiple different calls for each bird. The only problem with that is that every bird has a different call. <laughs> so what that means is, is out of all the different species, they all have a different call. Oh Lord, it would take a lifetime to try to memorize every one of them. So we don't, you just pick the birds you wanna find, you learn that call and you go out and you look for it. But the cool thing is, is a lot of times we just use mnemonics to help us remember. Now with this guy, the mnemonic that we use is, who cooks for you, who cooks for you, whoa! Now of course the bird doesn't say that, but what it helps us remember is that pattern. He puts that little trill at the end. And a lot of times when he says, who cooks for you, it sounds like he's saying hoot. But even if he has that exact pattern or a little bit different, he's always gonna have that funny little trill at the end. If your speakers are up, birds So if you listen to this guy, you can hear one get going, another get going. There's that funny trill at the end. Now I get a lot of questions about uh, that kind of sounds like monkeys. And my answer is usually the same. If you're camping in Georgia, the likelihood that you're surrounded by monkeys is pretty slim. But I say that because the most misunderstood sound in the woods at night is a bird. People think when they hear these sounds that they hear other things. Around here, one of the favorite sayings that people say is, is I heard a mountain lion last night sound like a screaming woman. Um, there's a couple problems with that. One, we don't have mountain lions around here. And two, cats are silent hunters. They only make little clicky noises and stuff if they're having to communicate, but they're usually solitary and they're not making any noise. What most people hear is an owl. And they just, because they can't see it, they don't recognize what it is. But around here, we also have this guy who is our smallest eared owl. And of course we call him eared owl because he's got these little tufts that stick up. They don't necessarily help him hear any better though. For the screechy, those little tufts actually make him look bigger and make him look tougher. The awesome thing is, is this guy is a generalized eater, but very specialized for where he is. If you notice, there's two color morphs. There's a gray phase and a red phase. It just depends on where they live. 
If they're here where we have a lot of hardwoods, then most of what you're gonna see is the gray phase. They just blend in well with the hardwoods. But if you go to middle and south Georgia, where you got more pine trees, you tend to see more of the red phase because they blend in better with needles and things of that nature. But this guy, one of my favorite things about him is how he hunts because he exhibits what we call cripsis. And cripsis is just a fancy way of saying having something special to help you hunt. It's basically what it means. In his case, what he does is these beautifully modeled feathers he actually flattens his body against the tree so that he looks like part of the tree and he stays there. Then when something comes by, he doesn't actually take off. He just opens his wings and falls out of the tree and dives after it. Other owls will sit out in the open and do what we call hawking. Watch, this guy will actually sit flattened up against that tree so you can't see him. The funny thing is, is because he's so territorial of that tree and where he's hunting, he's very well known for diving across the top of people's heads when they walk through his territory. But he's great to have around because he's not eating big rats and things like that. He's eating a little bit of everything else. Frogs, lizards, you know, small birds, anything, moles, anything that goes by under that tree. If he can get it, overpower it and get it down his throat, it's gone. But this guy, you hear him a lot in the summertime. And a lot of people say he just sounds kind of mournful, kind of sad. And he does. But he also makes we call a monotonic trill, which is just one note, which will but a lot of times people think that that's a frog. Another common confusion. That's a very common noise to hear in the summertime and people think, oh, listen to that frog. It's actually a bird. They use it in the movies a lot of times too as a frog and that drives birders crazy because we know it's not a frog, it's a bird. But this guy gets used in the movies just because of that lovely face. And I hate that I can't see you guys because I love to watch people's reactions when I pull up this bird because nine times out of 10, people either go, oh, or they go, because they're looking at that face. But if you think about what we said before, that's facial disc. If that much of your face is facial disc, then that is a bird that can hear like nothing else. That bird's hearing is so good that he can actually hear a mouse step on a twig 75 yards away. A mouse step on a twig, that's crazy. He gets the name barn owl because he actually likes to sit up in barns where it's nice and warm and cozy and safe and just listen for his prey out in the field because he can hear mice and things under the snow, no problem, and just dive out and get it. But the other thing I love about this bird is, like I said, they like to use him in the movies, but they don't like to use his sound. If you even watched the, um, the Beauty and the Beast movie from a few years ago that was live action, Belle walks right by this bird and he tilts his little head and he goes, Brrr. no, that's not what this bird sounds like. He sounds a little more like this. Yeah, and that's just, hi, how are you? I'm a bird, yeah. If you scare him, he'll actually scream it. Yeah like that. So you can imagine that movie might have been a little bit different if they had used his actual voice. <laughs> might have terrified some people. But this is our biggest owl and this guy we call the night tiger for a very good reason. Yes, he does have orange and black sometimes. This is the guy with the super big tail and those big eyes and that super tough beak. He can actually close each one of those feet with anywhere from 500 to 1,000 PSI. So when he shuts those feet, buddy, whatever it is is crushed and gone. But what's really cool about him is he skunks. So a lot of people ask me, well, you know, what animal would take down a skunk or what animal would take down this? Most birds, save for, you know, a few um, vultures, definitely. There are some, I think there's a total of, I don't want to say a number. There's a, there's a few birds that have a good sense of smell. Vultures have a really good sense of smell. Some can smell pretty well, but owls can't smell. They don't need to. And so this guy, he doesn't care about that skunk smell at all. But this is who actually says hoot. And his is the easiest to remember because he sounds like he's talking to himself. His mnemonic sounds like he's saying, who's awake? Me too. It's really easy. <laughs> Like he's talking to himself so it's simple but if he'll take a skunk remember that's the size of a cat so if you've got an outdoor cat be careful you got one of these but we can't just talk about those 
we got to talk about some of these daytime guys, some of our other birds of prey. I love to talk about the peregrine falcon because, of course, this is the fastest animal on the planet. Um, and just to give you an idea, little kids like to always say to me, cheetah. Cheetah's top speed is about 61.8 miles per hour. That peregrine falcon cruises at 65 miles per hour. His top speed varies depending upon who you're talking to, but officially is 215 miles per hour. Upwards, they say, of 240, which is just crazy. But the important thing for him to dive is actually this little bitty tiny bone right there in his nose. That little bitty bone does what those tatters on the feathers does. It makes that air swirl. And when the air swirls for a bird like him, he doesn't have to worry about breathing in and out. As he moves, the air just goes in his nose. But if he's going 215 miles an hour and the air goes in his nose, his lungs explode. That's not cool. So that little bitty bone makes that air swirl, which slows the air down and he can dive as fast as he needs to. So his wing shape is different, his feet are different, even the feathers over his eyes are different, everything to make him as fast as possible, which is fascinating. But this is a very, very, very big happy story for us in DNR, because as most of you know, in the 70s, we stopped the use of DDT, then we started promoting habitat for our birds of prey, and this guy came back to natural places naturally, and that made us very happy. We find them in places like New York and in Atlanta up on the tallest you know, skyscrapers, and that's not unusual because that's how they get that speed. But what makes us so happy is when they come back to natural places. You can actually see these guys at Salula Gorge. You can stand on the uh, south rim and look across to the north rim, and they've got a nest right there, which is really cool. But the kestrel, somebody asked about the kestrel. This is our smallest bird of prey in Georgia. His whole entire body is about that big. But notice he's still got absolutely everything that the other guys have. He's got the hooked beak, he's got the talons, he's got the works. But here's a cool thing about this guy. Notice there's two different colors. Most of your birds of prey don't have what we call sexual dimorphism, meaning that you can tell the males and the females by color. You can usually only tell by size. Um, for example, the, um, the red-tailed hawk, the female is usually two to three times the size of the male. But in these guys, the gray, that flashy gray, that's a male. This red sort of muted, that's a female. So that's a really cool thing about these guys. Red tail hawk, of course, we know so well, and we know him mostly because of his sound. It is that very famous sound. Now with kids, I often say to them, oh, doesn't that sound like a bald eagle? Not at all, not at all. The reason being is simple. Bald eagle, they wanted him to sound really cool on television, so they stuck the sound of the red-tailed hawk over the body. That's simple. But red-tailed hawk, even though he's the most common hawk in all of North America, is not actually the most common hawk in Georgia. In Georgia, his cousin, the slightly smaller red-shouldered hawk, is the most common. So when you see a hawk on the power lines, nine times out of ten, it's actually a red-shouldered and not a red-tailed. The easiest way is just to listen. If you see him, but you can't hear him, look at his tail. If you look at that tail, he looks like he's got a stack of Oreos. Black, white, black, white, black, white. That's really obvious. But if you're walking out of your house in the mornings, just listen. Because if you've got an open field anywhere, which includes your yard, then you will hear this. They are conscious and they are persistent. The awesome thing is they're persistent where they live. So if, they're, if they build a nest near your house, they're going to live right there their whole entire life, wiping out all the pests that you have around your house, which is no problem. And they're not big enough to take something like a cat. They're too small for that. But just a couple of specialty guys that are really cool. This is an osprey. So if you go down to Lake Lanier, you know on Lake Lanier we have Osprey Island. It's this tiny island, but there's a big old dead tree on it, and there are osprey on it. The super cool thing about osprey is he's totally built for hunting fish. He's one of the few birds of prey that can close his nose. So his nose closes up when he dives underwater, so he doesn't get water for his nose. But the coolest, he can actually take that outside toe and turn it completely around backwards. So when he's on a limb like that, he's got three toes in the front and one toe in the back so he can hang on. When he goes to catch something, he turns it around so that he's got four toes, two in the front, two in the back to hang on to that fish. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Swallow-tailed kite, definitely we see him in Georgia, not so much up here. But my favorite thing about this guy is he just chooses to be silent. He flies really, really high up, so he could be over your head and you'd probably not see him. But he chooses not to make a lot of noise. He chooses to just hang up there. And then when he does need water, he does need food, he just sweeps down and takes what he needs. So his camouflage is height, which is just cool. 
but you can't talk about birds of prey without the bald eagle, of course, because he's our national symbol. He almost wasn't. If you don't know, the, um, Ben Franklin wanted the turkey, and with very good reason. Turkeys work well together. They eat seeds and insects and things like that. And even in the mating season, the male's heads are red, white, and blue, which is fabulous. But he got overruled. We end up with the bald eagle. But the reason we changed the bald eagle's voice on TV is simple. Because the bald eagle actually sounds like this. And it sounds like he's laughing at you. So if you think about it from a movie perspective, it's a lot cooler for that bird to go than it is for him to actually chirpy chirpy like that. But this is not a weak bird. Look at the size of that talent, just so you can see that tiny. And he's got not one, but two of these massive, easily three, almost four inch long talons. Just a fascinating, fascinating bird. But I have talked enough about birds. Let me stop sharing and get out of here in case we have any questions. I would love to answer any questions that you may have. We have like two or three minutes, sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, I think if everyone's okay, maybe we can go a little bit longer over time. Um, you know, if you guys do have some questions, we'd love for you guys to get them answered. So um, we'll go ahead and get started with that. We have one from Paviel, I hope I said your name correctly. Um, she said, with working in local government, how can I help promote and educate myself and others about the importance of raptors in our local environmental ecology? Oh, fantastic. Um, there are lots of things that you can do. There are lots of, of course, um, lots of people around that, that deal with birds. So you can always get with somebody like that. So you can get with Department of Natural Resources. You can get with Forest Service. You can get with any of those types of groups. Um, but there are also a lot of people that are falconers. And usually it's even easier to get a falconer than it is anything else. To be a falconer, you have to have a license, but a falconer a lot of times does educational programs. And so if you have an event or you have a class or you have something like that, then falconers a lot of times will come out and bring their birds and it's fantastic. We have a guy here that's a falconer and that's what he does for pest control. So people actually call him when they have too many squirrels or whatever, and he actually brings out eagles and hawks and stuff to take the squirrels out of his yard. So those are some really great people to contact. Cool. We have another question here from Brenda Jackson, and she's wondering uh, if you have a regional map showing where the different birds of prey are. Yeah, the best thing to do is just get like a Peterson's field guide. Um, that'll give you general ranges. But there is a really cool thing that was just created with Georgia DNR. If you go to georgiawildlife.com, um, we now have a portal where you can go into that portal for the state of Georgia and you can select different birds, different plants, things like that. And it'll tell you where they're found in the state. Really great for doing educational stuff because if a kid is wanting to say, do a project on bald eagles, he can go into that portal and put in bald eagles and it'll show where the bald eagle nests are in Georgia and he can gather more information from there. So if you go to georgiawildlife.com and then look at the portal, then there's lots of information about specifically Georgia. If you're looking, you know, all over the United States, easiest thing to do is just get you like a Peterson's field guide. Or if you don't want to carry the book, um, uh, Merlin Bird ID is a great one for your phone. It's free and you can actually just put in, I saw, blue, white, and red on a power line here, and it was about the size of a robin, boop, and it'll give you a list of what birds it could possibly be, what their range is, what their breeding colors are, even their sounds, everything, it's fabulous. It's one of my favorites. Great, do we have any more last questions? I know we're right about at the end of our time. Um, if anybody has any last? All right. Well, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap up. Thank you so much, Kathy, for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. It was such an amazing presentation. I loved hearing all the different calls. Hopefully, I'll be able to identify some of them in the future <laughs> when I'm out camping. Berlin bird ID. Put it on your phone. Makes it easy. Perfect. I will definitely do that. That was very nifty. Um, all right. Well, uh, we just have a few closing uh, remarks for you guys. Um, if you have not done so already, please go ahead and join our Confluence 2020 Facebook group to keep up to date on all of our upcoming sessions 
and connect with uh, fellow conference attendees. Uh, additionally, if you don't already, please follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Keep up to date with our latest going ons um, and see cool pictures of us doing workshops and, and uh, hear about the events that are coming up with the Doctor Stream. Um, this is only our second week. It's the first, uh, first session of our second week of Confluence. So we have so many sessions coming up. Um, please register for more. We'd love to see you uh, at some of our future sessions. Um, those are all up on our, Confl our Confluence page on our website. Um, so yeah, go ahead and register for those on the session registration page. And if you are not able to join a session in the future that you are interested in, they will all be recorded and posted onto our resources and recordings page and on our YouTube account. Yes, and we also have our silent auction going on. So it's running up until the end of the month. So go ahead and get your bids in. Uh, you can find a link to that in the chat and also on our website. And at the end of this webinar, you will be directed to a brief five question survey. Um, so if you have the time, please fill it out. We appreciate your feedback. And if you have any questions for ourselves um, or are interested in getting involved with Stream, you can always send us an email, which is also in the chat. But thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Um, you know, we really enjoyed the session. Thanks, and uh, we hope to see you again soon. All right, thank you. Bye.